Right, um, we now move on to the second presentation, everybody. Um, it, it's going to be from Dale Milliken of Chivas Global Brands and Katrina Russell of Sign Salad. Um, the title of the presentation is Using Semiotics to Evolve the Descriptors of Whiskey Flavours. Chivas Brothers had identified that um, there's a need to try and excite and engage new consumers globally by breaking away from standard descriptions of whiskey, old fashioned titles such as rich, creamy and smoky, and adopting a, a unique visual and verbal flavour library. Dale and Katrina will tell us how semiotics and language analysis were used to uncover evolving cultural meanings and expressions of flavour internationally. Enough from me. Um, before I leave you, remember to put questions into the Q&A box and to remain aware of the fact that you will be rating the presentation. There's an element of competition today. So, Dale and Katrina, the floor is now yours. Great, thank you, Tom. Uh, Katrina here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Really delighted to be talking through this project which is all about telling the story of how flavor is changing and opening up the whiskey category to new consumers globally by understanding the changing meaning and communication of flavor, as Tom has said. So this project was a collaboration between Perno Ricard and Sign Salad. Hello everyone, I am Dale Milliken, the Senior Insights Manager who led this project at Perno Ricard. So a little bit of an intro from me about the business. So Perno Ricard is the world's number two in wine and spirits. And Chevis Brothers is the brand covered company within the group, uh, which holds some of the world's most successful whiskey brands. Now, these include three of those brands we'll be taking you through today, which the project was centered around, and they include Chevis Regal, the Glenlivet, and Ballantines. And Sign Salad is a cultural insight agency. We use semiotics and language analysis to unlock meaning for brands globally, from Kraft Heinz to Condé Nast. And I'll talk more about how we use semiotics in just a moment. So more from me. So essentially, whiskey has long been an intimidating category, regularly defined by pre-existing flavour descriptors. And in Scotch, we always gravitate towards using the same language, fruity, sweet, smoky. And this has essentially become the norm within the, within the industry, across the industry. And ultimately, as the category grows, the challenge we face is how do we differentiate our approach to describing whiskey flavour? one that could continually excite and engage new consumers. So working together, our objectives were twofold. One, we wanted to refresh the language and visuals of the whiskey category across key markets, the US, China and Spain. And two, we wanted to create clear brand stand up for the Chivas Brothers portfolio and really define a distinctive visual and verbal flavor library that could open up the world of whiskey to more people by making it approachable and accessible. In the cultural imagination, whiskey has repeatedly been associated with certain stereotypes, some of them aspirationally smooth and sophisticated, others far less so, and mostly rooted in ideas of masculinity and expertise again and again. These cultural ideas are powerful things and they have an impact on how flavor is perceived and expressed. With this project, we really wanted to update the whiskey category by moving away from the traditional flavor descriptors upon which it has long relied. We wanted to create an exciting new way of expressing flavour that would be more aligned with contemporary consumer expectations and lifestyles, while also crucially accounting for global variations in flavour experiences and understanding. But before getting into the story of flavour, a really super brief look at how we actually use cultural insight and semiotics. So the first principle to consider here is that brands are inseparable from the culture that surrounds them. Brands are often interested in what's going on in these inner bands, the key competitors, the category, but a consumer will approach a brand from that outer layer, from their cultural perspective. Semiotics enables brands to gain competitive advantage by understanding how culture is changing and how a brand can position itself at the forefront of cultural change. Semiotics ultimately is the study of how signs and symbols communicate meaning and how meaning changes over time. Cultural meaning is all around us. It constantly impacts our attitudes and our decision making through visual and verbal cues that are often so subtle that we don't even realize it's happening. So let's take a classic example of how everyone is ultimately a semiotician. When we look at a house like this on the street and we see balloons on the door, we don't stop and think, ah, oh, let me decode the signs and symbols. We already know there's a birthday party going on in that house because it's been signified to us by that sign on the door. 
However, if we were to put a black wreath on the door with the balloons, we come away with a lot of confusion because of course a black wreath tells us something very different. It's a very different funerary context. The same thing happens with brands, with communications and with packaging. Consumers will back away if there are contradictory messages that they don't understand and can't put together. Semiotics gives you control over your brand meaning. The next key principle to cover here is that culture, of course, doesn't sit still. It changes over time. If we go into a supermarket, we can start to observe that kind of cultural change. Looking at one particular aisle, we can see that there are those brands which are present, they're dominant, they're mainstream, they're familiar, but they're generic and they're not moving the category forward. If we look towards the right hand side here, we can see that there are, there are those brands which are future facing. They're more emergent, they're in touch with cultural change and they're more at the leading edge now, but they will have an impact on the mainstream and dominant conversation. Oat milk being a clear example of that. Ultimately, semiotics is about driving brand growth by aligning brands with that cultural change and positioning a brand at the forefront of cultural change. So with that in mind, an overview of how we've approached this project all about refreshing flavour. We started out with key expert interviews, understanding in depth what flavour really means and how it's changing. We then explored that change in more detail, looking at the emergent language and visuals for key whisky flavour descriptors. We then looked at how to apply that with a brand analysis of the Glenlivet, Chivas Regal and Ballantines. I'll just talk through the Glenlivet today. And then recommendations around redefining flavour across each brand and each market. So starting out quickly with the expert interviews. We began with these in-depth interviews with flavor and scent experts, revealing insights about what flavor really means to people globally and establishing hypotheses on the evolution of flavor descriptors. We interviewed Ruth Spivey, sommelier, probably responsible for some of the wine lists you might've seen in restaurants. Barnabé Filion, if you've ever smelt an Aesop or Lelabo fragrance, you've probably encountered his work. And then Mina Holland, deputy editor at Guardian Food. And we came away with three really key insights that helped shape this project going forward. First up, flavor and aroma fundamentally connected to nostalgia, to memory and personal experience. The first time you try alcohol at a wedding, your grandparents' apple pie and so on and so on. So how can flavor descriptors actually open up and account for those personal differences rather than shutting subjectivity down? We also looked at luxury in relation to flavor and found that luxury has previously been about ostentation, excess and power, but today luxury is more and more about authentic knowledge and knowledge of provenance and product sourcing. And finally, we found that we're moving away from really fixed traditional rules around flavor. So a certain way of holding a glass or having a certain foodstuff or drink at a certain time of day, that's all giving way to more experimental creativity and freedoms. So when it comes to the new representations of flavor, we got more granular in the next stage using semiotics to decode the changing meaning and representation of 15 traditional whiskey flavor descriptors in the US, China and Spain. And we looked across comparative categories to understand how those visual cues, language and multisensory cues were actually changing. And those 15 descriptors um, are outlined on this slide here. So they've become, they've become sort of regular vocabulary of whiskey, but they don't open up a space for people to express their own authentic experiences. And these were uncovered with Shivers Brothers from previous consumer research as the terms that people defer to essentially again and again. In order to understand how each of these 15 terms were changing, we followed this structure. We uncovered the dominant flavor codes, cultural codes and representations of those flavors. And then on the right hand side of each slide, we've got the emergent flavor codes and representation. We highlighted for each the visual language and multi-sensory cues. And I'm just gonna show a summary version of that today, focusing on fruity and sweet. So starting out with representing fruity, what we found was that in the US, dominantly in whiskey, fruity was written a lot of the time, but it was very rarely actually visualized. And when it was, it was shown in these highly controlled, curated, stage managed settings um, in kind of clinical backdrop a lot of the time. What we found across categories emergently is that fruitiness is depicted with vibrant and vivid graphics and hues. It's highly specific. It goes into the exact detail of the variety, the provenance, the process that got that fruity flavor into the product. And it's also embraced in fruitiness in terms of luscious, abundant detail. So communicating the excitement of that fresh fruit quality rather than fruitiness as something that needs to be closely monitored and controlled on the left-hand side. 
In China, um, we saw mostly the same kind of shift, but a few key differences. Importantly, there's this contextual difference in that in China, fruity can evoke gift giving and ceremony because fruit is common in well-wishing baskets. What we found again on the emergent side was that fruitiness was increasingly bold. It was about freshness and natural vibrancy and vivid illustration. So communicating more and more the excitement around fruitiness. If we look at sweet, we can see that in the US dominantly sweet whiskey draws on this very rigid, rigid narrow set of cues that are associated a lot of the time with syrup, with caramel and with toffee, uh, often referring to toffee and caramel visually and linguistically, coding a really intensely saccharine experience. But more emergently, we found that there was a combination of cues of sophistication and kind of complex gourmet sweetness with nostalgic co confectionery comfort. So a blend of sort of high level with familiar comfort and when it comes to sweetness. In China, we found something very different going on. So sweet has historically been expressed as the taste of luxury, of rarity, and often juxtaposed with bitterness. More emergently, we found that sweet was communicated again as more sophisticated, as being really multi-layered, maybe juxtaposed with spiciness or saltiness. And it was about excitement derived from imported sources rather than just from natural sources. So that's just an overview of how we approached each one. And we repeated that approach for 15 different flavors. And what we found overall across all of the flavor descriptors and across the US, China, and Spain was that flavor representation is moving from generic, non-specific terms like fruity to increasingly particular terminology. So from sweet to burnt caramel, molasses, sweet almond, from fruity to understanding exactly which type of blueberry, which part of the cherry is being referred to from spicy to slow burning, uh, black saffron and so on. Another key overarching takeaway was that the way we represent food, drink and flavour in general is changing from studio settings, from special effects, from highly stylized representations of mouthfeel towards actually including the human presence in the image and having this kind of perfect imperfection. A lot of the time that's driven by social media, which has effectively made everyone a food photographer. So you know, the way we represent food, flavour, food, drink and flavour is changing um, and we wanted to include that as a way to communicate the authenticity of a flavour experience going forward. We were also attentive to the local differences in flavour. So, for instance, whereas Spain has this residual confidence in traditional and local flavours and foods, it has a more selective library of emergent flavour cues that need to be managed more carefully um, and combined a combined you know, approach in terms of dominant and emergent flavour cues. By contrast, in the US, flavour is a part of this ongoing search to discover new trends and innovative approaches and optimise them and really create new things with them. So the US market had the widest library of emergent experimental flavour cues to draw from. We also found that there was a real opportunity in whiskey and tea, particularly in China, where mixing high-end whiskey with tea is a popular way to make spirits more refreshing, to moderate spirits for drinking culture, and also really opening up an opportunity in terms of feminine, quote-unquote, taste. So floral and fresh flavours of tea, with tea blends being an uh, opportunity to really open up the whiskey category to the female market. And what we came away with from this stage was ultimately um, a clear lexicon that could communicate flavor more emergently across each market. And this is actually a global flavor wheel that we included in a booklet, the cover of which you can see on the top right. Um, so we have in the middle here, the six dominant terms, fruity, sweet, floral, spicy, and so on. And then on the outer band, we have in three different languages, the emergent terms that can be used to update and refresh those flavor descriptors. And in the booklet, we brought this to life with visual cues for each, because of course, visual and verbal cues of flavor have to go hand in hand and align in terms of meaning. But I'll come back to that in recommendations. Because how do we ultimately apply this then to the Shivers Brothers portfolio? Well, next we did a brand analysis exploring the ways that three key brands communicate whiskey flavors and how far each brand was aligning with the dominant or emergent codes of flavor in each market. So we looked at the Glenlivet, Shivers Regal and Valentine's and I'll just focus on a summary of the Glenlivet findings today. Our approach involved what we call a granular analysis of distinctive assets. So we looked at the deeper meanings of colours, of imagery, of texture, language, tone of voice and so on, both from the perspective of China, the US and Spain, uncovering the ways that flavour is being communicated to consumers both explicitly and implicitly. We looked at how far each brand was aligning with dominant and emergent flavour codes and crucially we identified actually are there any flavours that are being communicated unintentionally that are irrelevant to the brand's flavour profile. 
So without further ado, the Glenlivet. Now the Glenlivet was actually going through a pack redesign while we were looking at this. So we found that the Glenlivet was already evolving its flavor representation in line with emergent meanings. Whereas previously they'd had this green glass and dark plum red top communicating dark and peated flavor, as well as a burnt edge effect on the label, which communicated a sort of aged and toasted effect, both of which were dominant in represent flavor representation, but also not aligned with the flavor profile of the product. We could see that more emergently we were moving um, with the new design into a more contemporary space. So we have the teal blue brighter kind of green color evoking water and contemporary urban color palettes which aligned with emergent lightness. We also have the cutaway label here, the clean lines, the negative space, all aligning with the emergent idea of lightness as fresh clarity. And what we came away with for each brand was a summary table that looked a bit like this. So on the left hand column here, we've got the communicated flavors that are coming through across pack, across comms with a tick if they're actually relevant to the flavor profile, a summary of how that flavor is being communicated. And then in the final column, is it being communicated in a dominant way or in an emergent way? When we came to our recommendations, we looked at how those that, that are dominant can actually be updated to be communicated in an emergent way. So. In terms of recommendations, just to give a quick quote from Alex Robson here, the head of heritage and education for Shivers Brothers, Pernod Ricard. The innovative semiotics of flavor project, project allowed us to find a new and culturally relevant voice, and in that sense was groundbreaking in Scotch whiskey. Crucially, what we were focused on here was providing actionable insights that could um, tailor the products and also Scotch whiskey mentoring uh, specifically for the first time to the audience. So, our findings opened up this new library of visuals and synonyms that Shivers Brothers brand teams could use to open up the world of Scotch and really talk about it in an updated and contemporary way. In order to apply learnings to each SKU, we had the pleasure of working with Master Blender Sandy Hislop to map each and every SKU against the new flavour wheel and thereby inform the recommendations tailored to each brand. So just coming back to the flavor wheel here, applying each of these to each brand in the most relevant way. Uh, and here's just a little look at what was in that booklet. So these are some of the uh, meeting points of the visual and verbal cues that were both uh, emergent and could be used for each of the brands. How do we know which of these are going to be most relevant to the Glenlivet, Chivas Regal, and so on. So we made specific recommendations uh, on the ways that each brand could evolve flavor representation in line with cultural meanings and in line with their sensory profiles. And we outlined specific visual and language cues to dial up or retain because they were already aligned with uh, cultural meaning or sensory profiles to dial down or evolve with clear recommendations on how to do so and then to import. So in terms of the Glenlivet, for instance, and I won't read out everything on this slide, uh, but for fruitiness, we recommended importing hand-drawn or non-computerized visuals, perhaps just using bold, bright colors to represent the fruity appeal of the flavor. And as you can see at the bottom there, we had synonyms for uh, the US and for China specifically. We also had those key watch outs around peaty and dark and um, toasted and how to move away from those. In terms of smooth, we made recommendations again divided by pack, language and sweetness, again divided by imagery, pack and language, moving towards more specificity, moving towards that blend of complex and sophisticated layers with nostalgic simplicity in terms of visual approach. And just to give an indication as well, and for Shivas Regal, we made recommendations on how to communicate floral across markets in the middle column here, and then how to communicate floral in the US and in China, where there were slightly different meanings in the emergent representation of floral coming through. So making sure always that findings were localized and accounting for global variation. And the ultimate kind of output here was the booklet and the wheels. So we had this takeaway booklet that brand teams could use and um, could kind of make their own, combining the global flavor wheel with clear recommendations and mapping, as you can see, um, around the edge of the wheel, brands against those emergent flavor segments in order to know where they could play um, and which flavor cues would be most relevant to them. And now over to Dale. Oops, sorry. No, 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 the joys uh, of IT. No, no, um, I'm going to take you through now, guys, from the client side, how we translated this into action. You know, how Project Flavour drove impact around our Scotch business. So first of all, it helped inject excitement into our drink strategy. Uh, as Katrina mentioned earlier, we uncovered tea. Now, tea is big in Asia and we brought it through to the Western markets um, where our brands are present. And we launched, you know, the Glenlivet and tea, a new drink strategy over in North America. 
But similarly, we looked at the sort of brunch moment, uh, new moments, new serves, new occasions with Valentine's and tea in our European markets. Secondly, it inspired innovation. So Project Flavour was the driving force behind the development of our flavour notes, moving beyond describing liquids simply as fruity, instead being more specific. So red apple, zesty orange, really getting specific. Um, and we worked closely with our master blender to ensure that that was um, applied. Secondly, it also helped identify a gap in the TGL range for a sweeter finish. As a result, we launched the Glenlivet Caribbean Reserve, an expression which breaks old whiskey conventions by bringing rum, barrels and scotch together for the first time in our history. Now this delivers a fruitier tropical note and it helps open up the category to new and younger drinkers. And one thing to note, it was launched in the US and it was launched two months ahead of COVID-19. And even, even with the arrival of the pandemic, this SKU still managed to outperform expected sales targets. It helped inform our Scotch business strategy. So as was mentioned earlier, we work closely with Sandy, our master blender, the mastermind behind most of our successful liquids to map out each of our SKUs against the emerging flavor codes. And this helped identify opportunity spaces as such was Caribbean Reserve, but also future opportunity spaces in our NPD pipeline. And last but not least, least it made us rethink how we talk about scotch. So a quote here from, again, Alex Robertson, our global head of home and brand heritage. He was discussed earlier, but a direct quote from him here is the insights provided by the semiotics of flavor allowed an immediately actionable, new and innovative approach to Scotch whiskey mentoring, tailoring specifically for the first time to an audience by taking into account cultural and verbal cues. So with this in mind, Project Flavour became the basis of our How to Nose and Taste module. And this is within our Scotch Whiskey Academy. So just to sort of bring it to your attention, this academy sees over 500 Pelno Ricard employees annually come through its door for training. So we've opened the doors to the academy and everyone is now understanding all about Project Flavour and how we talk about taste uh, in a sort of new future facing way. Secondly, the results were shared across our four brand homes in Scotland and the distilleries and onto our international graduate ambassadors program in 28 countries. I do believe we've got roughly about 80 graduates in that team and all have now been trained in project flavor. As such, another quote here is, you know, we've revolutionized our tasting notes and inspired ambas ambassadors of Scotch whiskey to make their education sessions more culturally relevant. So in that sense of things, it's helped us reignite and re-inspire and re-excite Scotch. You know, we're moving away from being boring, dull and grey to being more culturally relevant um, and interesting for younger audiences. And that's it. Cheers, everybody. Um, now over for the Q&A. Many thanks. Excellent. Excellent. Really, really good stuff. And thank you both Dale and uh, Katrina. Um, that was a fascinating presentation. I really didn't see the time disappear past so, so quickly. Um, as uh, Dale has just said, let's move on to question time. So the first question is from 